So in this part, we're going to pick up where we left off with Russia, with Lenin dead and the Communist Party without a leader. And we're going to find how um, the Soviet Union really moves into what we're going to call an authoritarian or totalitarian state. In the wake of the death of Lenin, we're going to see the Communist Party kind of uh, fall into a pretty extreme power struggle as uh, the next or a bunch of people compete to become the, the next Lenin. Uh, Leon Trotsky was what many people thought w was who many people thought was going to be the next leader. He had been Lenin's right hand. He had been instrumental in organizing a lot of um, the early part of, of the revolution and the early days of the Soviet Union. Um, but he ends up getting uh, removed from party leadership by, by this, this young human right here. He gets into, oh gosh, he gets outmaneuvered by Joseph Stalin. Uh, Joseph Stalin pairs up with a bunch of other Communist Party leaders to push Trotsky out of power. And then once he's gotten Trotsky out of power, he pairs up with different party leaders to push his first paired party leaders out of power. And then he pushes those guys out of power until it's basically just him. Uh, Stalin, who was born uh, Yosef Zhukashvili, uh, who is a uh, Georgian, he's not Russian ethnically, he's, he's Georgian. And um, apparently always spoke with a Georgian accent. He had renamed himself when he got into the revolution to make himself sound more Russian. And so he changes his name from uh, Zhugashvili into Stalin. Stalin coming from literally meaning in Russian, the man of steel. He had been a major player in the October Revolution, uh, so much so that when the Soviet Union takes over, Lenin uh, appoints him as secretary general of the Com Central Committee, which a bunch of people at the time thought was just paperwork, but really was an excellent way for, for Stalin to make sure that the people who um, got placed in positions across the, the Soviet Union were people that were sympathetic to him and knew that they had their job because Stalin gave it to them, which really let him gain a lot of followers, which helped him when he wanted to push Trotsky out of power. Lenin was not very fond of Stalin. While he had been a huge supporter of the revolution, Lenin personally didn't have nice things to say about Stalin. In fact, one thing he said was that Stalin was rude, and he thought that Stalin would concentrate too much power into his own hands. Um, while you see in this photo here, uh, Stalin with the big mustache is sitting next to Lenin and they look relatively chummy. This is the only photo that we have of the two of them together. Um, and once Stalin takes power, one of the things that he does is, is run an information campaign where he tries to, not tries to, he successfully removes people from ever existing. If you take a look at these two photos over, over here, um, you can see that something's changed in, in each of them. And um, basically once Stalin removes Trotsky from power, he goes through and removes Trotsky from ever existing in every photograph. Uh, Stalin was famous, not famous for saying, but said, uh, death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problems. And he's the person who's going to take control over the Soviet Union. Uh, you can see in these three pictures, we have an original photo with uh, Lenin and Trotsky sitting next to each other saluting. You can see Trotsky is the one with the, the fun glasses. And then we have years later a reprint of, of the photo as Stalin used images of Lenin to gain support for the Soviet Union and, and promote his, his ideas of like a, a, to draw a connection between what he was doing and what Lenin stood for because Lenin dies so early on in the Soviet Union that he gets immortalized as kind of this leader of the people who had the people's interests at heart. And Stalin wants to connect himself to that brand or that idea. And so um, Stalin uses photos of Lenin to promote support for the Soviet Union after Lenin's death, but he doesn't want to remind people of Trotsky, who was actually a lot closer to Lenin, and so he just has Lenin, rem he has Trotsky removed from photos. In fact, he has anyone who, who stands out against him, who's an important political party member, removed from photos. So in, in Russia, when you stand against the government, it's not just that they throw you in Siberia, it's that they throw you in Siberia and then anybody who remembers you and is stupid enough to say it out loud, off to the gulag with them. And then they remove any evidence of you ever existing. 
And this this comes back to a saying that Lenin was was popular for, which is a lie told often enough becomes truth. That if you uh, can you imagine if you woke up tomorrow and your neighbors were just gone, not all of them, but like the house next to you, that that one, you know, the one I'm talking about, just all of your neighbors were gone. And when you asked the other people in the neighborhood what happened to them, they denied ever knowing that the neighbors existed. I mean, you would have known that you knew them. But also, if everybody else pretends that they don't exist, at some point, you start to question what is real. That questioning of truth, that questioning of what is factual is essential in the Soviet Union, uh, controlling the people by, by telling the lie frequently enough, they can make their own truth. And so we see Stalin uh, take control of the Soviet Union, and he ends up having to define what Soviet socialism is going to look like. The world has never really seen a, pre a purely socialist government, and so uh, Stalin resolves the, the uncertainty of what socialism will be by clearly defining it as the opposite of capitalism. So capitalists have a bourgeoisie parliament who promotes the interests of the rich, so socialism is going to have Soviets that protect the workers. Capitalism has uh, unregulated markets, which are inefficient and have high unemployment. So socialism is going to have economic planning and, and full employment. Everyone who wants a job is going to have a job. Capitalism exploits private ownership, uh, which leads to unequal distribution of wealth. So socialism is going to outlaw private trade and property, making sure that to each according to their needs. Stalin's main goal was to make the USSR a strong, modern, industrial nation, taking it from the agricultural past that it had been stuck in and bringing it into the modern world. He ends up replacing the new economic policy with his approach to the economy, excuse me, which is a return to war communism or a command economy where the government controls all aspects of the economy and production. He does this when he comes out with his first five-year plan, and in that five-year plan, his goal was to bring industrial and agricultural capacity of Russia um, from, you know, the, the feudal agriculture all the way up to becoming a world leader in agricultural production. He does this by taking control of all of the small businesses and trying something called collectivization. So collectivization is where all of these small rural farms, which were only able to produce what the small farms could, uh, were grouped into large, huge farms, which is a lot of our food today come from giant industrial farms. That's what that Stalin was pushing for in Russia. But he didn't want to leave um, the wealthy farmers in charge of the farms because he didn't feel that they were loyal. So he kicked out the wealthy farmers who had been successful in farming and replaced them with party loyalists and a whole bunch of equipment. But a bunch of farming equipment, I don't care if it's the newest farming equipment, and a bunch of Communist Party loyalists does not replace a, a well-educated farmer. And so we see these collectivizations, these large uh, collective farms, end up not producing what, what they're expected to produce. Landowning farmers, known as kulaks, were really reluctant to join the collectivization process. They didn't want to give up their land, especially when it had been in their families for generations. And under Lenin's NEP policy, they'd, they'd actually made a, a decent amount of money. Um, and so uh, Stalin ends up using the Soviet propaganda machine to paint them as the greedy enemies of the working people, that the reason that there's famine and starvation isn't because the collective farms are failing. The reason there's famine and starvation is because the greedy kulaks are burning the food rather than letting the Russian people have it. So Stalin ends up ordering the kulaks to be liquidated as a class and arresting dissidents uh, and, and executing people and sending people off to work camps in the Gulag. Here we have a bunch of Soviet propaganda that uh, I think highlights a lot of the narratives that Stalin was trying to, to give through um, the rise of the Soviet Union. And so we see Lenin depicted here uh, pointing forward to progress. We see Stalin in a similar pose uh, echoing Lenin. We have a flag of uh, Stalin and Lenin and, and the Soviet youth 
as the youth become a huge part of the success of the Soviet Union. Pause on that for a second. Why do you think Lenin and Stalin both target the young, the teenagers, uh, with Soviet propaganda? Why are they trying to convince a bunch of teenagers to join their cause? Why is it that we see totalitarians across the world uh, really focus on people your age when trying to uh, win support and loyalty? We'll come back to that. Uh, we also have the Soviet worker denying uh, weapons and, and wealth uh, from the greedy, evil monopoly man who represents capitalism. There's a lot of um, exaltation and, and, and uh, celebrating the worker and uh, a use of really strong imagery to represent the strength of the leader and the party. With Stalin established as the leader of the Communist Party, Soviet supporters set out to build the socialist utopia that they had been promised and um, really wanted to found that, that new Russia on um, modern technology. And the irony of it is that they ended up buying a lot of that new technology from uh, the depression-mired capitalist countries that they were so opposed against. The, Europe is war-torn and needing finances, and here's Russia able to um, buy up a bunch of machinery that, that the, the war-torn countries of Western Europe aren't using. More than 10 million people built factories, hospitals, and schools, and the Soviet uh, five-year plan, like Stalin's five-year plan, was able to eliminate unemployment entirely when the rest of the world is in the Great Depression. Take a moment and think about that. At a, at a point where uh, we've got 25% unemployment in the US, one in four people are unable to find a job, Russia has 100% employment. Everybody who wants a job has one. On top of that, Russia leads the world in literacy rates as uh, public education is mandated. Why do you think Stalin is so uh, adamant about public education? What does he gain from, from spending time um, educating not only the young, but the elderly? There were actually people who were sent out into rural Russia uh, to teach people to read, regardless of their age. Stalin wanted everyone to be able to read. What is he going to gain from everybody learning how to read? What are they going to spend their time reading? They're going to read state-controlled media, which is exactly what Stalin wants them to read. They get to, to read the communist narrative that he puts forward, which says everything is fine and we're successful. Even though by 1932, most industries were failing to meet their goals, agricultural production was down because it turns out that when you put a bunch of non-farmers in farming positions, you don't just magically end up with a bunch of food. And they were unable to meet what had been unrealistic production quotas set out at the beginning of the five-year plan. In the Ukraine, it gets really extreme. In order to meet quota, uh, the government ends up taking so much of the food that's produced in the Ukraine that it leads to mass famine. And over six million people die in a year in the Ukraine because the government is collecting the food uh, as a part of the quota in order to make sure that they're meeting the production set by Stalin. This mass famine is, is largely kept out of the news uh, for all Russian people. They don't know that it's going on because um, the state-controlled media is able to hide it, which means that even though the first five-year plan is collapsing and unable to meet its goals, uh, Stalin is able to announce that the first five-year plan is such a success that it met its goal a year early. And that results in posters where, uh, you know, two plus two equals five, where we're celebrating the success of the five-year plan in, in the light of a six million person famine. I mean, way more than six million people starved. It's just six million people died from that starvation. Stalin immediately launches his second five-year plan. And in his second five-year plan, he focuses on rapid industrialization and production of goods for the, the Russian people. And he sets way more realistic quotas, which allows it to be so much more successful. And, and here's a quote where he says, we are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or they will crush us. And here we see Stalin using another s skill 
out of the totalitarian or dictator's playbook where he's creating that sense of an enemy in order to uh, move the people to urgency, that we have to get caught up or we will be crushed. And um, the second five-year plan is, is successful and Russia is able to go from one of the least industrialized countries in the world to one of the most industrialized countries in the world. His third five-year plan is going to be all about militarization in order to protect them from what he perceived would be the new German threat. And he's not wrong. Despite the success of the second five-year plan, opposition to Stalin had grown out of the failures of the first five-year plan, and the state-controlled media is unable to keep all of the horrors of uh, this very oppressive rule um, from, from spreading. And so Stalin is given little choice but to... Um, not little choice. Stalin's given a whole lot of choices and Stalin decides that when people start opposing him, he's just going to get rid of them. And so his way of getting rid of them is a terror campaign that makes it impossible to re to like speak publicly against him and secure his control over the USSR. He uses, uh, again, in the dictator's playbook, he uses the assassination of a key party member to justify arresting all of the other party members. I mean, we'll never know for sure, but most historians believe that the party member who, who was assassinated was assassinated because Stalin ordered his death. So Stalin kills one of his rivals and then uses that death to justify getting rid of all of his other political rivals. It's a brilliant move where you use fear in order to make sure, uh, in order to take actions that would normally be seen as you know, like unjust or illegitimate or greedy or, I don't know, you can't go around killing your political rivals in most governments. But here you can because you, you made up an enemy, right? There's someone threatening us, therefore it's okay if I take this severe action. And we see uh, Stalin use that, that fear to create what he's going to, or what, what history will call the Great Purge. And this is an effort to eliminate anyone who might be an enemy of the people. When we say people, we really just mean person, and that person Stalin. He used show trials to force public confessions of, of fake crimes uh, by his political rivals. So not only did he arrest his political rivals, he then tortured them or threatened people who are close to them to get those political rivals to confess to crimes they didn't commit. And these public show trials were very clearly fake you knew that these people were confessing to crimes that they didn't actually commit. And while the people watching the, the show trials on state-controlled media were aware that it wasn't real, it just reinforced how powerful Stalin was. Because if he's able to make the political party leaders admit fake things, fake crimes, admit to fake crimes, what could he do to you? Keep in mind that with dissonance, uh, the secret police, anytime they heard rumors of someone being against the party or against Stalin, they would round up uh, people and, and send them off to gulags in the night. You really would wake up to your neighbors just completely disappeared. And so uh, they rounded up lower level party members who uh, were educated. He rounded up lower level party members factory managers, anyone in a lower position of power who started to use that power to maybe question what Stalin was doing would, would be gone, and along with their family, off, off to the gulag. Kulaks, non-ethnic Russians, Jewish people, engineers, lawyers, teachers, writers, artists, anyone who, who was in a position where they might speak out against him were labeled as enemies of the state and forced off into gulags or killed. And they put a number to all of this. The show trials resulted in over 750,000 Russians executed and the arrest and deportation of, of millions more. Uh, at least 1.8 million Russians were imprisoned in gulags by 1930. And this is going to go on for another decade. Stalin ends up destroying economic and personal rights and freedoms to meet the needs of the state, making Soviet socialism just another form of totalitarianism, which is a government centered around a dictator that requires complete subservience to the state. He takes this idea of a workers' party uh, and Lenin's idea of a workers' revolution and turns it into uh, a one-man controlled 
state. Now, some historians argue that Lenin probably would have done the same same thing. Lenin did a lot of um, really severe things in order to ensure that he was the one in control and that he was not sharing power. For as much as he argued the benefits of a Soviet, he, he himself single-handedly made a lot of decisions early on in, in the Russian Civil War. Um, but, but with the death of Lenin, we don't really know what he would have become. But with Stalin, we see him become uh, a, a, an individual above the rest of his people. And, and we see, um, you know, the, the needs of the many lost as really the Soviet party becomes about whatever Stalin wants and however Stalin can maintain control. Next week, fascism. <laughs>